Welcome to the Straightport Connection with Tommy. This video is on your SmackDown 205 Live Mixed Match Challenge results for the week of November 27th. Birthday for the 27th, Davy Boy Smith. He was born 1962. He died of a heart attack at the age of 39 on May 29th, 2002. Ever Courageous turned 45 years old. The late Hiro Matsuda died from prostate cancer at the age of 62 on November 27, 1999. November 28th birthday is Eric Rowan. He was born in 1981. Summer Ray was born in 1983. Condolence to go to WWE Hall of Famer Edge as his mother pa mother passed away at, uh, at uh, on Tuesday. Her name was uh, Judy Copeland. Edge posted following the Instagram on her passing. Today I lost my mom, Judy Copeland, aka the Jude Meister. The only parent I've ever had. She was my rock, my back, the backbone and bedrock that kept my balance through some very tumult tumultuous years. She never doubted me, ever. I wanted to be a, a wrestler, Ma. Do it. She scraped together our pennies and kept me, f kept me fed and clothed and even managed to get me those Kiss action figures and, and WrestleMania tickets somehow because that's what she did. She supported me and bred me to be the man I eventually became. Took some elbow grease, but I got there. A point where she knew I was going to be fine. I found an amazing partner, and I'm the father to two beautiful little girls. I live my dream and continue to do so because she watered me and let me blossom. She did her job, but I wish uh, she could, could have stuck around to see the fruits of, of her labor longer. To the very end, she showed me where, where grit comes from, from your heart, your spirit, your, your mana, your flame, your spark, your soul. I can honestly say I don't know anyone who had more. She's free now, and even now thoughts of her make me smile. This, that's a, a life well lived. Hey Jude, take a sad song and make it better. You always did. Dark man, um, Main events advertised for SmackDown taping is AJ Styles, Rage Mysterio, and Jeff Hardy versus Miz, Randy Orton, and Shinsuke Nakamura. Stay tuned for what actually happened. The woman who played the fan in the crowd during last last night's Raw segment was Sasha Banks. Bailey, Alexa Bliss, and Charlie Caruso was Minnesota indie wrestler Kara Noya. Kara is a graduate of the wrestling school ran by former WWE and TNA star. Mr. Anderson. Anderson. She tweeted the following on her on her appearance at Kara underscore Noya. Oh, looky there. Christopher Huffman. It's Shuffman. Kara Noya dropping a pipe bomb on Monday Night Raw. Kara underscore Noya. Various Twitter guests of who I was when I was on Raw tonight. Brock Lesnar's daughter. Jinder Rousey. R Rousey's sister, part of the equipment team, WWE trainee, ex MMA fighter, due to my arm size, female Heath Slater. Also, Karen, uh, Carol underscore Anoya, none are true, but all are funny. Well, the Marine Six uh, released last week with the Miz reprising his role as a film star. For the first time in the series, the same director was used for multiple movies as James Nunn directed the film actor. Also directing Marine, the Ring 5. Nunn also uh, joined Nick Hosman on the latest edition of the Wink Leave podcast, which drops this Thursday, where he discussed making the film and revealed he only wanted to be part of it if The Miz also returned. Nunn then talked about the premise of the movie role, a uh, movie, while also discussing a huge twist in the movie, which affects the series' future. It's going to be Two Marines in a tenement flats. None, none says that the premise that was told to him by the movie studio. They're going to, they're going to fight their way out. And spoiler alert, guys, I'm going to say it. We're going to retire, Mike. That means, that means kill him off. We're going to. Uh, I don't want to say it. Uh, I'm, go I'm going to say it. We're going to kill Mike, guys. We're going to kill Mike. I said it. Oh my God. On the phone, I was like. What did you just say? Can you repeat that? They were like, yeah, we're going to kill him. I went, I don't know if we, we should be doing that. 
This is crazy. Who does this? I've never seen a movie where they've done this. We should think about this. None then talked about how he needed to think about the film. And it's free my eyes for a day before he truly committed to the project. Then he thought it through and realized doing the movie that way would be amazing because it would be something different and unex unexpected. You can keep making marine movies, but they're always going to be something and something. There's only so many of them that, that you can watch, stated Nunn. That's where, with Mike being killed off, obviously didn't detract none from the film. As he stay, uh, stayed on as director, Mrs. Character being killed off also allows the series to shift directions and gives new breath to the franchise as if continued beyond the sixth installment. Uh, Marine Six Close Quarters is available now on, on video. In addition to starring the Miz, Becky Lynch and Shawn Michaels are also featured in the film. And Shawn Michaels was the main character as well as Becky Lynch. She was the main heel character. And she actually fought HBK towards the end of the movie. And by the way, I seen the movie, and it's better than the previous ones with more action. CM Punk was interviewed by MMAFighting.com to discuss his commentary debut for the Cage Fury Fighting Championships CFFC event on December 14th in Atlantic City, New Jersey. During the interview, Punk was asked about the rumors of Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks starting their own promotion. While he said that pro wrestling is not on his radar, he said that he would listen to them. Punk also denied Cody Rhodes' comments to Wrestling Inc. about an offer being made to him, suggesting that Cody's pitch was not a real offer. Here are the highlights. Rumors Cody and the Young Bucks starting their own promotion. I think at this point that uh, whatever these guys decide to do will be great for them and their families. If I was asked what I would do or what I would say to them, because they could obviously go to WWE whenever they want, it's just a matter of is it this? Is this what's best for your family? And I think we live in a time now where WWE is not the end all, be all. I don't think it has been for quite some time. I think the stigma that it is still there and probably will persist for many, many years. But enough people have been there and left that can, I guess, extol the knowledge of, hey, you know what? The place ain't all that. And I'm in that spot right uh, now where I've, I've Go what five years? Uh, maybe the place has changed. I've got a lot of people who text me and, and say otherwise, but there's ways to make money and support your family outside of that. With also being able to satisfy the side of your brain that's creative, the side of your brain that loves professional wrestling, the reason you brought a pair of boots in, in the first place. And I think those guys can definitely do that. I think they co command their price if they want if they want there but if they did go there they just uh, be another guy that just like everybody else on that show it's amazing the more time the show gets the less time it really seems they develop new characters if you would listen to an offer from Cody and the Young Bucks rumored promotion I would always listen I would listen to them because just like Dave I like the Young Bucks I text with Matt on and off what business is business? I know Cody was out there in the media saying that an offer was made for the all-in event September 1st. An offer was not made, calling me up or texting me saying, hey, if you want to come to the show and do something, we would love that. It's not an offer. That, that's not an offer. There's other things. There's a couple of more loose ends that I'm still trying to tie up to fully absolve me from the world of pro wrestling. I feel like I've still been attached to it since that day that I left it, and mostly because of Fugazi lawyers and 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 such. But we're right, wrapping all that up, and that's come that's come to an end. And once I'm truly free, we can explore the world and just float and hang out. I can walk my dog and drink coffee and and do documentary for Dave Scholler and continue to train. Rough you sport and do all kinds of stuff. I've learned it. I've paid my dues. Punk also discussed his commentary debut 
still being a part of the UFC roster and in the USA DA pool. His loss to Mike Jackson and more. You can read the full interview by clicking this link. When Kerry Sane lost to the NXT Women's Championship to Shayna Bassler at WWE Evolution, many expected her to be called up to the main roster. The theory only grew when she lost to Shayna in a rematch at NXT TakeOver War Games. If anything, she would team up with Dakota Kai and Io Shirai against Shayna, Jasmine Duke, and Marina Chaffer before getting the call. Unfortunately, she won't be doing much for the next few days or weeks. It was revealed on Twitter, her Twitter account that saying it's suffering from a hand, foot, and mouth disease. This is something that children normally get, which confused Carrie when she made the announcement on Twitter. Ouch! Hand, foot, and mouth disease? Carrie saying. Translating the tweet from Japanese resulted in the posting. The fever has gone down, but now my hands, feet, and mouth have a mysterious eczema. Ouch! You go to a hospital with it? Even in the United States, hand, foot, and mouth disease? It's a disease that, that infants under five years old have been examined. Why did the virus enter my body by mistake? LOL. There's no known cure, but getting some rest usually helps, depending on the severity of it. If anything, Carrie should be back on her feet in no time. Kurt Hawkins will be replacing Braun Strowman in the Max Max Challenge later on in the results. He will be teaming with Emma Moon to face Jenna Mahal and Alicia Fox on next week's episode. And here's a post video of uh, Taylor Braxton talking to Ember Moon and, and Hawkins uh, after Ember's win over Fox from Raw. And as Frank Hawkins said, they're a match made in heaven because he hasn't won and she hasn't lost. Hawkins, who, who has lost 236 straight matches since returning to WWE, believes his losing streak will finally come to an end. My guess, prediction. It won't. And with their with a loss, they're gone from the Mixed Max Challenge. Wrestling World was first introduced to Ray Mysterio's son, Dominic, in 2005. The eight-year-old was part of a WWE storyline in which Eddie Guerrero was claiming to be Dominic's biological father, only for Mysterio to defeat Guerrero to retain custody of Dominic, which can be seen at this link. Dominic is now a grown man. And following in his father's footsteps to become a pro wrestler. Mysterio joined Lillian Garcia's podcast where he talked about his son training for the ring and his plans for the future. His training has been going incredible, stated Mysterio. He started his training last year in Florida and trained a little bit with Jay Lethal. And this year he uh, took a big, bigger step and went up to Canada. And he is finishing up a three-month session up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada with Lance Storm. He is, he is done November 30th, where he comes home. And when we move on to phase three, which is up in the air, but I'll begin earlier. It'll begin early next year, January 2019. I talked with Booker T already to set him up in Houston, Texas, with Reality of Wrestling, or Mexico City to pick up some Lucha Libre style. Mysterio also learned of a Lucha Libre style during his training with his uncle Ray Mysterio Sr. taught him the, the ropes in Mexico. While Dominic will take after his father in that aspect. Luckily won't follow his in Mysterio's footsteps by wearing a mask. No, I don't think he wants to wear a mask. He has something special to do with, with the mask just to represent. And to pretty much honor his father, said Mysterio. But I think since he was known already when doing this as a kid. And we post pictures together. It's kind of hard. For me, final dream come true as a wrestler and as a father is to be able to perform in there with my son so that I can say that I have done it all. Like, okay, this is it. It's going to be, it's going to happen. I believe it is. And it can be found on this link as well. From Lillian's podcast. Because Dominic is still so early in training, his father hasn't been able to see him perform in the ring in person yet, only through social media. But Mysterio is just proud that Dominic is following his path, especially since Mysterio never expected his son to go to go this route. I was sharing a video last night with his uh, godfather, Conan, 
I showed him a video of Dominic taking backdrops in the ring. And again, I, was, uh, I am telling Conan to check this out. And he was telling me how good he is. And do, he was doing and how good he looks in the ring. And I was telling Conan how proud it makes me feel as a father to see, it, to see him involved. Revealed Mysterio. I never would have pictured him doing the stuff that I've been doing pretty much 30 years of my life. He liked it as a kid, but really wasn't into it like I was. I grew up in professional wrestling. That was all I wanted to do. It's so much different. I never thought he was going to break into the business. Well, Starcade. I'll give you some of the uh, results from Starcade. It took, as it took uh, from uh, taped on uh, the 25th and posted on the 26th of November, Starcade took place at the U.S. Bank Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, where Intercontinental Champion Seth Rollins defeated Dean Ambrose during the main event. A report from the show, courtesy of Wrestling Inc., reader Marcus Dietz. First, the most surprising thing to me was the actual attendance from the show. The building was pretty packed. The floor looked sold out as it did most of the first level. There were several sections of the second level that were quite full, too. If I were to take a, take a guess, I'd say there was 8,000 to 9,000 fans present. And that can be found in this link. The event started off with Elias in the ring. He played a little uh, jingle before Ric Flair came out. And that's, a, that's what the link is uh, going to show you. Uh, Flair got, a, got, got very enthusiastic and appreciated appreciative welcome from the crowd. Elias and Flair talked back and forth for a few minutes as Flair and Elias is talented enough to have any woman in, in, in the building he wants except for his daughter Charlotte. Shortly after this, Nia Jack's music started to play. Nia was joined by T Tamina, Mickey, and Alicia. The four of them joined Elias and Rick, attempted to sing something. Nia started to sing poorly on purpose, which prompted Elias and invite some of his friends down to the ring. Out comes Sasha Banks, Bailey, Dana Brooke, and Ember Moon. This led to the first match of the night, which can be found in this link, which is your eight women's tag team match, Nia Jackson, you know, Mickey and Alicia versus Sasha, Bailey, Dana, and Ember Moon. This was a fun match and a nice kickoff to the, to the night. Nia got a ton of heat from the crowd. She obviously one of the least popular superstars on either roster right now. Danny Brooke has, has a nice showing in the match, as did Mickey James at about the say about the eight-minute mark. Sasha got Alicia Fox in the bank statement, and she tapped out. My thing is, they did that and uh, had her as a face on the event, but overall had her had her as a heel, helping out Mickey. And the melee on from Raw. And this next link uh, was uh, next was uh, Finn Balor versus Drew McIntyre. Balor received a huge reaction from the crowd. Did Dolph Ziggler accompany McIntyre to the ring and was a pest to Balor the entire match. McIntyre is, in, is a physical freak, very strong and powerful. However, he had some of the worst looking kicks to, to the mid section I've ever seen. Regardless, McIntyre wins the match in an eight minute match after hitting. Battle with a Claymore kick. The Revival versus B Team. It didn't have a link for, for a match. Actually, uh, uh, the reporter actually wore a Revival shirt. And so I was pleasantly surprised to see them. Dawson and Wilder both cut a decent promo before B Team came out. 18 Chant was very popular during their entrance and throughout the match. The Marceline Curtis Axel pinned Dash with a sunset flip in about five minute match. Um, uh, Mark, I was stunned. Next was SmackDown Tag Team title match featuring the Bar Champions versus the New Day. New Day got a great reaction out of the crowd. They were playful and threw, uh, threw pancakes at people. As Bar came to the ring and was, were picking up random pancakes and throwing them back at the New Day. People laughed at that. Big E and Kobe were the participants in the match. Xavier Woods played the trombone on the outside. There were some playful spots in the beginning, a few minutes of the match. Things picked up. Sheamus hit Big E with a broke kick and pinned him to retain the title in a nine-minute match. Good action from everybody there. The teams have nice chemistry together. We were introduced to the Raw General Manager, Consumated Corbin, 
He informs the crowd that Braun Strowman will not be here tonight due to the beating he received during this past week's Monday Night Raw. But Corbin knows that he will. We will all we all pay to see him, and he doesn't want to let us down. So he issues an open challenge to anyone in the back. The lights suddenly go dark, and then Bray Wyatt appears on the entrance ramp to a huge ovation for his return. Wyatt accepts a challenge. He brawls with Corbin and eventually pinned him with a schoolboy in a six-minute match. Corbin is irate. He gets uh, on the mic and demands this match to be erased from history. He then uses his power to create create a rematch. However, this time, it's an ODQ match. Wyatt versus Corbin, match two. No disqualification match. Corbin motions to the back. Out comes Ziggler, Andrew McIntyre. The three of them put a beating on Wyatt before Elias and Finn Balor come down to even the score. The chase... They chase Ziggler and McIntyre back at the ramp. Elias does some strange move that I'm not familiar with. Balor hits a coup de grace on Corbin. Then Wyatt picks him up, kisses Corbin on the forehead, and finishes him off with his Abigail. Pinning Corbin for the second time in about five minute match. And then they had intermission. Coming back from the intermission, Charlotte Flair's music starts. She comes to the ring and says something unmemorable unmem about Ronda Rousey and asks who will be the next person. To get a beating. Out comes Oscar to a great reaction. Lots of back and forth action in this match. Neither Charlotte nor Oscar is working as heel, but the crowd is more in favor of Oscar, believe it or not. I say it was 60 40 or maybe 70 30 in favor of her. Charlotte ended up reversing an inside cradle of some sort and pinned Oscar in about 10 minutes. Afterwards, Charlotte raises Oscar's hand and they both pose for the crowd. Solid match. Up next was Miz TV. Miz got a great response from the crowd. And welcome up is welcome with the Miz's awesome chance as Miz, Miz, Miz chance. Similar to the yes chance, Miz has a smile on his face and says he appreciates that on the eve of the Cleveland Browns beating the Cincinnati Bengals. And that turns the crowd against him. Out comes his, his two guests, Ray Mysterio, wearing a neck brace as a result of Tuesday's attack from Randy Orton and Shinsuke Nakamura. And the action can be seen in this thing. The two of them talk to each other, noting over, overly more memorable here. Then Nakamura attacks Mysterio and beats him down pretty good. Miz is calling for a referee to come out to start the match. And that can be found in this thing. The match officially. U.S. Uh, title match featuring Shinsuke Nakamura versus Rey Mysterio. Ruff comes down to the ring and checks on Mysterio. He's fine and the bell rings. The Miz is still outside the ring at, at this point after about five minutes of action. Mysterio has Nakamura set up for the 619 but he's getting ready to hit Miz interferes against Nakamura and disqualified. They beat down Mysterio to Rusev, followed by Lana, runs in to make the save, which can be found at this late. Lana gets on the mic and issues a challenge to the Miz and Nakamura for a tag match against Rusev and Mysterio. They accept that the bell rings. Lots of action in this match. Surprisingly, Rusev and Mysterio are actually a very good team. I don't know if they teamed up before at other house shows, but they seem to have good rapport with, with one another. Then the sequence of this match was Mysterio hitting 619 on both Miz and Nakamura. Miz then stands up to eat a Moscow kick from Rusev and is pinned in nine minutes. Mysterio, Rusev, and Lana all pose for the crowd as Rusev was wildly over for the evening. And then they had a cage match, AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe. This was originally supposed to be for the World Championship, but not any longer thanks to Daniel Bryan. A lot of great action in this map bout. These two have great chemistry working together. Of course, they were in TNA Impact Wrestling. Uh, many big spots in the ring and have some aggressive tosses into the cage. Styles catches Samoa Joe in a calf crusher and Joe taps out in a 12-minute match. The crowd was behind Joe quite a bit. <coughs> but AJ was clear and obvious babyface. And that action can be seen at this link. And it got an all title match in a steel cage. Featuring Seth Rollins as champion versus Dean Ambrose. Rollins was out first to a big reaction. Ambrose was out next with a big even reaction since he's from Cincinnati. Ambrose takes his sweet time walking to the ring and his disgusted look on his face. He walks around the cage and is stalling. Rollins gets tired of waiting and exits the cage to go after Ambrose. He beats Ambrose down pretty good and then starts hitting him with a kendo stick. The two finally enter the cage and the door is shut. Rollins is still using the kendo stick on Ambrose. Ambrose finally rustles it away, but Rollins, from Rollins, it starts hitting him with it. 
A lot of back and forth during the match. Ambrose had, had Rollins tied up in a trio. Tied up in the corner. and could have easily walked out of the cage, but he chose to try and climb out. Rollins freed himself and caught Ambrose. As Rollins actually hit Ambrose with a super, super flex while Ambrose was on top of the cage. Then immediately transitioned into the Falcon Arrow. Ambrose just escaped at about two and three quarter mark. A few minutes later, the two are battling on top of the cage. Ambrose falls back into the ring and decides to go for the door while Rollins elects to climb out over the top. Rollins escapes first to retain the title in 21 minutes. This was probably the best match of the night. And that concludes Starcade. And it can be found in that link in there. Overall, was an event. An enjoyable house show. Uh, the event started at 7.30 and ended at 11.02. It was much a much longer event than I anticipated. I'm curious which matches will be shown on the network later on. Bray Wyatt's return made, made sense, but I think they're, they'd better off just show, show clips of the two matches between him and Corbin. Rollins vs. Ambrose uh, should be shown too. The most favorable crowd responses in the evening went to Sasha, Banks, Finn Balor, Bray Wyatt, Rusev, AJ Styles, Dean Ambrose, and the B-Team's chant. Not necessarily the B-Team itself. There really weren't many negative responses from the crowd, aside from Nia Jax, Baron Corbin. To a, a certain extent, Drew McIntyre, I couldn't begin to think about the rating, rating these matches, of, as most of them were all pretty much the same. Good quality, how show matches, but nothing spectacular. The Ambrose Rollins match was clearly the best. They weren't really any bad matches, although the revival losing to the B team in quick fashion was unexpected. I think the crowd was into everything on this night, and I hope that comes across through the network special. Impact Wrestling Stars, LAX, will no longer be facing WWE NXT superstars at the upcoming Evolve events in December, as Impact officials have pulled them from the show. And that's because they don't want the competition facing each other. As noted earlier, LAX and Santana and Ortiz were set to face Evolve. Tag Team Champions, the Street Profits, Montez Ford and Angelo Dawkins, of NXT, and Leo Ruff and AR Fox in a triple threat. Dance at Dece the December 15th Evolve event in Queens, New York. Uh, they were to then to team with Austin Theory to face the Street Profits and Darby Allin at the Evolve event in Long Island the next night. The matches were just announced by WBN live this morning. WBN's Gabe Sapolsky, who also worked for WB with the NXT brand, took to Twitter today and announced that the Impact has pulled LAX from both Evolve events. There's no word yet on who we're replacing, but as soon as he posts it, I'll post it as well. And you can also tweet yourself to uh, Gabe at Book of Gabe. As he uh, tweets, uh, Impact Wrestling has pulled LAX off the 12th, December 15th and 16th dates. Working on replacement sound, I was just informed. Our apologies to the fans. The XFL will be bringing a team to St. Louis for its revival in two, uh, 2020. According to a report by KSDK. It was noted that the remaining seven cities receiving teams will be announced next week. St. Louis was the home of the Rams before the team moved to Los Angeles at the end of 2015 NFL season. According to the report, the new St. Louis XFL team will play 10 games in its inaugural 2020 season, with five of them being held at the Dome in America Center. XFL is scheduled to launch in 2020 with the league owning all eight teams. An SEC filing this past May revealed that WWE is a minority owner for the league. Vince McMahon said $100, $100 million worth of WWE stock back in December to help launch the parent company of the league, Alpha Entertainment, and told insiders that he expected to spend an estimated $500 million in the first three years of operation. Chris Rowden contributed to this article on that. Tonight's SmackDown will feature a segment with Jeff Hardy celebrating his 20th anniversary with the company. 
the Hardy Boys made their official debut back in 1998. And this uh, video here is uh, Mike Rome talking to Hardy while backstage at Target Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota earlier in the day. And he says, I'm nervous, you know. It's very surreal. It's been 20 years, half of my life. I've been part of the WWE and this wild universe. So it's crazy what we're celebrating, my story tonight. As Hardy said, Rome asked Hardy about possible surprises and what we can't expect tonight. Hardy said, one thing I've always been known for is unpredictability. So I'm guaranteeing you it's going to be the most unpredictable celebration in SmackDown history. So we'll see what happens. Hardy also commented, commented on the poss on possibly working for the company for another 20 years when Rome asked what's next for, from him. Hardy said, oh gosh, I'm just going, going to try to continue to do what I do every night and entertain the Jeff Hardy fans. Paint my face to my best ability. Who knows what the next 20 years will bring. And Tate from Minneapolis to air on 205 Live episode. Noam Dark defeated Mike Kanellis. Hideo Tommy defeated local enhancement talent. What a name. Ari DeVere came out after the match and attacked the jobber, apparently to show up a Tommy for his return. Cedric Alexander and Masaf Ali defeated Tony Nese and WWE Cruiserweight Champion Buddy Murphy. SmackDown opened up from live from Target Center. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, SmackDown General Manager Paige welcome to the show. She introduces SmackDown's Women's Champion Becky Lynch for her return, but not in ring action. Becky makes her way out for a pop as Tom Pellis welcomes us. He's joined in by Corey Graves and Byron Saxon. Becky takes the mic and fans start chanting her name. Becky says, "Any time is too much time away when you're the hottest thing in the industry." Becky talks about how she wanted to fight at Survivor Series, but she was stopped. She goes on and says she's done watching. But because, because she's putting herself back in the game, Becky still wants to face Raw Women's Champion Ronda Rousey now that she can. She wants to get right to, to business as she calls out Charlotte. Fair to the ring. Music hits and out comes Charlotte as we see a steals from a Survivor Series match with Rousey. Fan chat for Becky with, again, it's a flare in his ring. Becky says Flair almost gave Rousey the beating that she would have, like Becky asked. But Rousey wouldn't be walking if it would have been the man in the ring with her. Becky goes on and accuses Flair of trying to be like her. Flair says she was being herself. The seven-time champion and the only woman on either roster that's capable of giving Rousey the beating that she deserved. Pay stands in, in between them so they wouldn't have a fight. Flair says she gave the beating to Rousey because she's genetically superior and has the mindset to do any Solitary thing possible to get the job done. Becky says Flair just went from copying her old man. WWE Hall of Famer Rick Flair to copying the man. Becky says Flair is it, just a bootleg Becky trying to take what's hers. And she won't have it. Becky is glad she beat some of the phoniness out of Flair over the past few months. Flair says Nia Jax must have hit Becky harder than she thought because she went from quirky to delusional. Flair says Becky is, one, is the one copying her dad and still managing to write her coattails. Flair tells Becky to shut up as she turns her attention to the camera, sending a warning to Rousey. Flair turns back to Becky and says she will fight her right now. They have words that Paige tells them to quiet down. Paige loves this, this fired up side and the desire from Flair and hasn't seen it in a while. Paige announces Flair versus Lynch in a TLC match at the TLC pay-per-view. The music interrupts. Out comes Sonya Deville, Manny Rose, Billy Kay, Peyton Royce, and Zelina Vega to the stage. Rose says this is a joke and insulting, insulting as Paige says no one else has shown the drive and desire that Flair has. Rose says any of them could have done the exact same thing to Rousey. And any, any of them deserve a title match with Becky, but Paige doesn't give them the, same, the time of day. Music interrupts. Out comes Naomi, Carmella, Oscar, and Lana. Naomi takes the mic, but the fans break out in a chant for Oscar. Naomi says, with all due respect, she knows Paige isn't questioning her desire. This leads to Paige announcing a battle royal for tonight's with the women's division, except for Flair and Becky. They will be at ringside. The winner will be added to the TLC match at TLC, making it a triple threat. Paige's music hits, 
and everyone looks around with each other. Well, my prediction was going to be Asuka, and stay tuned for the results. Show to come tonight. AJ Styles addresses WWE Champion Daniel Bryan. Also, Jeff Hardy celebrates his 20th anniversary with WWE. Uso's backstage, welcoming us to the Uso Penitentiary. We go to commercial. The Bar versus Uso's. Back for the break. Out comes first. Uso's, Jimmy and Jay. Well, who else? SmackDown Championship Champions. The Bar were out next for this non-title match. Cesaro Sheamus, we see the video from earlier today with Cesaro was yelling at a big show backstage about last week's Thanksgiving release. Fight loss to the New Day. Show shows Cesaro back into Sheamus. Show walks off as Sheamus yells at him, saying they are better off without him. So that Lee Oh, uh, they are no longer together anymore. Jimmy starts off with Sheamus as they go at it. Jay comes in and keeps up the attack, drop kicking Sheamus for a two count. Cesaro comes in, but the Usos make a tag for a double team. Jimmy works over Cesaro, but Cesaro ends up distracting the referee, allowing Sheamus to nail a cheap shot. Sheamus tags back in and they double team Jimmy. They yell out to the crowd. They would go back to commercial with Sheamus in control of Jimmy. Back from the break, and tomorrow double team Jimmy in the corner with a big move. Cesaro, Cesaro gets a two count. They continue to dominate until Jay gets hot tag. Jay unloads on Cesaro with a tribute to Rowan Reigns. Jay goes on and catches Cesaro with a small and drop. Jay with a Rikishi splash in the corner for another close to close pin attempt. Sheamus tags back in as Jay kicks Cesaro out of the ring. Jay runs the ropes and dies out onto Cesaro, but Cesaro meets him in midair with a big uppercut. Jay is rolled back inside the ring. Sheamus drops him with a big knee when he gets up. Sheamus with a flying knee drop from the second rope for another two count. Sheamus goes back to the top for a flying clothesline, but Jay blocks and sends him into the steel ring post. Jay with a super kick and another two count. As Jimmy tags in. Jimmy and Jay go up to the opposite side, uh, opposite corners. While Sheamus is lay, laid out, Sheamus with, with an uppercut in the middle, in the midair to Jay as he's flying off. Jimmy knows the, the use of his flash, but Sheamus gets his knees up. Sheamus mounts Jimmy and rocks him with, a big, with some big punches. Sheamus scoots Jimmy and tags in Cesaro for a double team finisher. Jay with a super kick to Sheamus from behind. Cesaro sends Jay to the floor, but Jimmy rolls him up for a two count. Jay tags in. They hit a double in Scary on Cesaro as he was stunned by another move. Jimmy tags back in and comes flying off the top with a splash. Jimmy covers for, for the non-title win, and now they get a title shot. After the match, Usos exit the ring. As their music hits, Mario looks on from the mat. We go backstage to the New Day and the Miz looking on from the locker room. They're watching something and laughing. Miz thinks they're watching the Marine Six, and that's what their favorite parts are. They're actually watching and laughing at the Miz. And Shane's, Shane McMahon's loss to, to the enhancement talents on last week's lost last week's SmackDown. Miz goes on about how he and Shane have been fighting for SmackDown, including the match at Survivor Series. New Day points out how they were the only ones to win a match. 14 SmackDown at Survivor Series. Miz ran, Miz ran some more. And says he can't beat all three of them. He goes on and says he will go to his co bestie Shane and get him to make the match for tonight. So it comes segment Women's Battle Royal with TLC implications. Also, Jeff Hardy celebrates his 20 years since his official WWE debut. We see AJ Styles backstage in, sitting in a chair, looking like he's in deep in a deep thought. A staffer approaches and tells him it's time. Styles gets up and heads to the ring as we go back to commercial. Back for the rate, out comes AJ Styles for his first appearance since losing the WWE title two weeks ago on, Sm on SmackDown. Well, I missed this part. I fell asleep and had to go to YouTube and watch it. Uh, not, uh, not YouTube, uh, some uh, Twitter uh, uh, things were from it. Back from the ring, out comes AJ Styles for his first appearance. Styles takes the mic and fans pop for him. He talks about losing the WWE title to Daniel Bryan and says no one likes to lose. But what bothers him is the way he lost. Styles shows us a replay of the low blow from Bryan and then, he, then the heel turn following the match. 
Styles knew he had, he had a target on his back as champion, but he didn't think the target would have moved to somewhere else on his body. Styles knows what it's like to want the WWE title so bad, you'll do anything to get it, but Brian went too far after the match with a kick to his face. Styles says he wasn't medically cleared to compete at Survivor Series, and he was just cleared this past week. Styles says he watched from home while Brian explained his action last Tuesday. We'll see a replay of Brian's promo from last week, where he declared that the Yes Movement is dead, and the new Daniel Bryan is here. Styles is looking forward to beating Brian's face in, and says we don't have to wait until TSE fans chat Yes now. He just says Brian isn't there here tonight, and he wasn't at the weekend live events either. AJ says it sounds like Brian has been watching Raw and got an, uh, got an idea of how they do things there. But this isn't Raw. It's the house that he built. AJ says for 371 days, he never missed an event because this is where he belongs. AJ tells Brian to make sure he's at TLC and he can bring his dreams and excuses. But he better not forget the WWE title because that belongs to AJ. AJ drops the mic and his music hits. Then the segment. Still to come, Jeff, Hall Jeff Hardy celebrating his 20 years since signing with WWE. Back for the break, the hype up the, the NXT superstar, Lars Sullivan. We get a coming soon video for his main roster call up. Shinsuke Nakamura was Rusev was up next. Again, I, I was so asleep for the match. We go to ring, out comes U.S. champion Shinsuke Nakamura for a non title match. Rusev was out next as Greg Hamilton does ring introductions. Rusev enters the ring. Nakamura immediately drops him from behind with a Kasasha before the bell rings. Nakamura puts a boots to Rusev and then delivers another to Kasasha. Nakamura le leaves up the ramp, but runs back down and drops Rusev at ringside. Again, his fans move. Nakamura raises the title, backs up the ramp as the music starts back up. We go to replay of what happened. Nakamura looks on from the stage and Rusev recovers. Looks like the match never started, so no match. Tell it come. Women's Battle Royal with title shot implications. Also, Jeff Hardy celebrates his 20 years since his official WWE debut. Michael Cole Hall will interview, will interview him. Back to commercial. Back for the right. Entire roster is out on stage. Michael Cole is in the ring with several photos blown up. Photo of Jeff Hardy blown on display. Cole Hall praises Hardy and introduces him. Hardy comes out to a pop. Cole Hall talks about Hardy officially debuting with 20. When 20, WWE 20 years ago and shows a video package with highlights from Hardy's career. We come back for the video and the roster is clapping for Hardy. Fan chant his name. Hardy doesn't know what to say, but he thanks everyone. Hardy says he can't believe he did half of those crazy moments. Hardy goes on and says he's experienced the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, but no matter what he's gotten himself into, people have stuck by his side and he's eternally grateful for that. As I woke up at that point, and thank you, Hardy, champ starts up from the crowd. Hardy signals for the delete chant. He says he wouldn't be here tonight if it weren't for his wife, Beth, and their daughters. He gives thanks again for making this night possible. Hardy says this is far from a retirement speech, and he doesn't know what the future holds, but he wants to find out together. He thanks everyone again and goes to leave, but the music interrupts. Out comes Samoa Joe with a microphone. Joe congratulates Hardy and asks him to forgive us his tardiness. Joe says he was in the back popping bottles and about to come out for a toast. But he can certainly, but we can all agree, for that bottle of champagne around Jeff isn't a good idea. Spatdog Commissioner Shane McMahon steps forward to get Joe to back off, but Hardy stops Shane, telling him to let Joe through the uh, through to the ring. Joe, now speaking from the ramp, brings up the video package on Hardy's career and says he was probably too in incoherent to remember any of it. Joe says he does not celebrate weakness and second chances, especially when there are men like him who haven't received their first. Jeff uh, gets another quick delete chant going from the crowd. Joe can't believe how Jeff allows himself to be put up on a pedestal after the mistakes he made over the years. That Joe makes that makes Joe sick. Joe says he let the people down just as much as he made them stand. Joe says people like Jeff never change because the demons are always lurking in the background waiting to take control. Joe says the next time Jeff becomes powerless and he knows it will happen, 
Joe will be there with his handout for a one step program, but it won't be painless. Jane, uh, Jeff says no matter what he says, Joe can't rain on his parade tonight. Jeff says he, he, he's walked the tightrope for 20 years and almost ended his career 20 times. But he's about the moments. He asked Joe if he'd like to make a moment here tonight. Jeff talks to Mike for a fight, but Joe walks up the ramp to the back as the fans move. Jeff music hit as he claps with the fans. So the comes segment, the Miz versus Kobe Kingston back to commercial. Back for the rate, we get a WWE shop Christmas segment with me from Naomi and the Usos. Miz versus Kobe Kingston was up next. We go out. We go to the ring, out comes the new day. Cobra kicks him with Big E and Zombie Woods. Miz is out next. Bell rings and they go at it. Trading shots. The holes in the corners. Hold the counters. Kobe with a splash on, on the mat for a quick pin attempt. Miz turns around, but Kobe closes out him over the top rope to the floor. Kobe go, runs the ropes to uh, leap out, but the Miz distracts himself, or distances himself. Kofi dances to the ring. Big E dances in front of Miz at ringside, distracting him, allowing Kofi to run the ropes to hit a suicide dive on the floor. New Day celebrating while Miz is down. Back to commercial. Back to the right, Miz comes off the off the top with an axe handle, but Kofi John kicked him out, out, of, out of the air as they got commercial going and the sidebar action. Of course, no sound. Kofi's uh, in control, hits a boom drop. Kofi waits for the Miz to get up, but Miz blocks per trouble in paradise. Miz is Miz block blocks the next move. Miz blocks another blocks the SOS. Kofi rolls Miz up for a two count after blocking the score crush finale. Kofi blocks the neck breaker, back breaker combo, and then Kofi nails the SOS for a two count. Miz comes right back with an EDT for a uh, four nut uh, close two count. Miz removes the tur top turnbuckle pad as the referee checks on Kofi. Biggie hits the apron and covers the exposed turnbuckle uh, turnbuckle with pancakes. Kobe gets up and makes a comeback on Miz now, but Miz stops him with a knee to the gut. Woods gets on the apron with Francesca, but Miz knocks him off to the floor. Miz tries to uh, bring a steel chair into the ring while the referee is distracted, but Woods grabs it. Miz turns back around to trouble in paradise. Kobe covers for the pin and win. After Matthew, they celebrate in the ring with pancakes. As they're throwing them to the crowd, we go to replays. Still to come segment, the women's battle royal. With a title shot up for grabs. Uh, we we'll see a sinister looking Randy Orton backstage. He will address his recent actions against Rey Mysterio tonight. Back to commercial. Back for the break, and out comes Randy Orton. He's holding Rey Mysterio's mask in his hand. We we'll see a, a replay from last week when Orton took Rey's mask. I sure fell off after their main event match. Orton says people have used all kinds of negative words to describe his actions against Rey Mysterio last week. Orton says he would use the word euphoric. He goes on and says he never understood what's, what's so special about this place of trash Ray wore on his face. Orton says he never bothered to learn because he didn't care. Orton says what he did last week wasn't to disrespect Ray's culture. It was to hurt Ray and bring him down from the pedestal that people have put him on. Orton wanted to prove that Ray is just another one of Orton's victims at this stage in his career. Another victim of the three most destructive letters in sports entertainment are Michigan Reps. Out comes Ray. Ray is wearing a neck brace. Ray rushes ring, but Orton meets him on the outside and they go at it. Orton launches Ray into the barrier a few times. Orton takes the neck brace off. And sends Ray into the ring. Ray kicks Orton as he enters. Ray has more shots to, to Orton, sending him into the ropes. Ray knows the 619, keeps the troll, and so hits the 619 for a second time. Ray goes outside of the ring and grabs a steel chair, raising it in the air as fans pop. Ray brings the chair back in, but Orton rocks him as he comes through the ropes. Orton hits the se second rope, jumping DDT on the chair. Orton goes to the floor and kicks the chair away. Orton uppercuts Ray back in the mirror as the referee warns him. Officials run down and try to stop Orton as he places the chair under Ray's throat and slams it into the steel ring steps. Some fans boo as officials check on Ray. Orton back, backed off as we go to commercial. Back for the break. Shane McMahon is backstage, but it was World Cup trophy. Miz is uh, confronting him 
asking him where he was. Just now, Shane was right here. Miz goes on about trying to make their team happen, but Shane says they're not a team. Miz acts like the trophy belongs to both of them. He says they are a family, and Shane needs to start acting like it. Miz leaves, and Shane looks confused. Battle Royal is up next. Carmelo, Randy Rose, Billy Kay, Peyton Royce, Selena Reagan, Lana, Oscar, Naomi, and Sonya Ville. We got to the ring for tonight's Battle Royal as Carmella comes out first. R-True joins her and wraps to, to the ring. Winner of this match will be added to the SmackDown Women's title match at WWTLC to make a triple threat. Mandy Rose was out next, followed by Iconics, Billy Kay and Peyton Royce. Zelina Vega was out next, followed by Lana. Oscar was out next to a big pop. Naomi was out last. Sonya Deville was also introduced. The bell rings and they go at it. We see Charlotte. And SmackDown Women's Champion Becky Lynch the ringside watching from their chairs, announcer chairs. Lana goes under the ring, uh, under the bottom rope, but she's still in the match. This leads to Vega being eliminated first. Vega is furious as she goes after Lana and puts, puts hands on her. We go to Merck commercial. Back from the break, Lana tries to eliminate Peyton, but Billy makes the save. Iconic double team Lana now, and Lana is eliminated. She did not go back under the ropes. Went back to the apron, but was eliminated somehow. Did not get back in the ring to be thrown over the rope. So that's my uh, complaint there. I kind of turn around to Asuka staring him down. She ducks their clothesline and delivers a hip attack to Billy. Asuka drops Peyton and tries to dump Billy now. Asuka sends them both out to the apron. Asuka hits the ropes and delivers a double hip attack to eliminate both of them. Asuka turns around to a huge kick from Carmella. Carmella takes Oscar to the turnbuckles. Oscar sends Carmella to the apron, and they both go go at it. Oscar unloads with strikes. Oscar kicks her off the apron, and Carmella has been eliminated. Deville and Rhodes double team Oscar now. Naomi take, makes a save. These are your final four competitors. Rhodes drops Oscar with a knee. Deville and Rhodes try, try to dump Oscar over the top now. Naomi makes a save again. Naomi unloads on Rose now with strikes. Naomi with a, with a rear view on Rose. Naomi with a springboard kick to Deville. Rose blocks a Hurricanrana from Naomi. Rose tries to dump Naomi over the top, sending her to the apron. But they both end up on the apron. Rose catches the kick, but Naomi sends her flying into the ring post. Rose has been eliminated. Deville comes right right over and knocks Naomi off the apron. So, it's, and Naomi has been eliminated. Deville and Oscar face off. Now as Deville puts her hair up, they go at it. Oscar sent, gets sent to the apron. Rose grabs Oscar's leg from the floor, but Oscar fights her off and delivers a flying kick from the apron. Deville tries to capitalize, but Oscar drops her. Still fighting from the apron, Oscar tries to suplex Deville out of the ring, but she hangs on. They trade shots on the apron, and they both go down after connecting at the same time. Deville charges, but Oscar nails a big knee to the jaw. Deville has been eliminated. Oscar is going to TLC to join Flair and Lynch in the title match. And my prediction was correct. After the match, Oscar celebrates as the music hits. Lynch and Flair look on from ringside. The announcer's hype. The first ever women's TLC match with Oscar versus Flair versus Lynch. With the title on the line, Oscar stares out at Flair and Lynch as they look on from ringside. Lynch talks trash back at Oscar. Raising the title in the air. SmackDown goes off the air as Oscar looks down. At them from the top of top turnbuckle to end SmackDown and beginning of the MFC Mixed Back Challenge playoffs featuring the Raw brand uh, Raw brand teams Ember Moon and Kurt Hawkins versus Jenna Mahal and Alicia Fox. Also Finn Balor and Bailey versus Bobby Lashley and Mickey James. Ember Moon and Kurt Hawkins were was first with uh, Alicia and Jenna Mahal. In my guess, was Alicia and Jenner advancing? And I was right. Ember isn't looking too thrilled to be uh, with her new partner. Ember starts things off with Fox and looks uh, early uh, for an early roll up for a two count. Fox does the same, two count. Ember gets in some offense. Fox is able to tag out. Mahal steps in. And Hawkins isn't exactly jumping into the ring. Almost looking for Ember to take Mahal on. Hawkins finally gets in the ring and Mahal el eliminates. Immediately grounds ground him at total Divas hips. Says 
at WWE Ember Moon unleashed at this link for your, your action. Hawkins do dodges Mahal a few times and finally lands a drop kick. Then close on Mahal out of the ring. Hawkins slides out of the ring, takes out the Singh brothers, gets on the apron, and Mahal boots him back to the floor, down to the floor. Mahal works him over, tosses Hawkins back in the ring, covers for a two count. Backstage, Bobby Lashley, Mickey James, and Leo Rush are, are getting ready, prepped for their match later on. In the ring, Mahal taunts Hawkins a bit, and he continues to wear down his opponent. Looks like Samir Singh is bleeding at, at the bridge of of his nose from that mini brawl with Hawkins. And WWE says, so, couple things wrong with this. Hashtag WWE MMC at the Kurt Hawkins at the at WWE Ember Moon at Jenner Mahal at Alicia Foxy. At this link, for your action. Hawkins finally is able to tag out Ember with a springboard crossbody and he's really putting the boots of Fox. Fox do dodges her, roll, roll up, cover, two count. Ember with a low super kick, pin, very close three. Ember heads up, heads up to the top. Hawkins tag, tags her foot as she hits the eclipse. Hawkins dives in for the pin, but it doesn't work like that. Ember with a double eclipse on the Singh Brothers on the floor. Mahal runs into the ring, hits the collars, covers it, that'll do it. And advancing to the next uh, semifinals, General Mahal and Alicia Fox by pinfall. Uh, next week, Miz and Oscar versus Naomi and Jimmy. Backstage, Caleb Braxton asked Fox about Fox and Mahal how it felt to win two straight matches. As it only took one win to advance the finals. Uh, to the uh, brackets, that should say. Fox says Jenner and the Singh Brothers finally listened to her, and that's why they won. Mahal mocks Braun Strowman's getting his hands catchphrase, and they head off. Mickey, uh, Mickey James walks by and says she doesn't know what Fox was talking about, but she and Bobby came here to dominate. Mickey James and Bobby Lashley versus Finn Balor and Bailey. Bailey and Lashley get things going. But Lashley quickly tags in James. Rush tries to get a Mickey chant going. Hops on the apron for a distraction. James strikes Bailey from behind and attacks her in the corner. Bailey is taken down. Low kick. Covers for a two count. James sends Bailey face first in the top turnbuckle. Bailey gets in one strike. James with a neck breaker. Covers for a two count. Body scissors on Bailey. Who leans back for a pin. James kicks out. Then yanks Bailey to the mat by her hair. Bailey kicks James away. Double clothesline in the center of the ring. A TD, uh, TD Wrestling, a total new sets, double stop by at Phil Balor. Actually, can be found in this link. Balor gets a tag, goes to work on Lashley. Couple of kicks, flying forearm. Balor tries to lift Lashley. Nope, Balor tries to trip, uh, trips him. Hits a double stop, chop to the chest. Balor tries for a kick, gets caught, a elbow to the head. Lashley sends back, then sends Balor flying down to the announce table. Lashley quickly tosses Balor back in the ring, pinned for a two count. Lashley mocks Strowman with a running charge around the outside of the ring. Victory lap. Bill, uh, Balor with a sling blade. Lashley gets back in the ring at nine. Balor looks to tag out, but James pulls Bailey down to the floor. Lashley with a shoulder block to Balor. And the action refound of that link. And WWE says, Finn's got to fly. Hashtag WWMC at Finn Balor. It's in, at its Leo Rush. And fight Bobby. It's Bailey WB at Mickey James. Lashley charges into the corner, hits the ring post. Balor is able, able to tag out. Bailey with a, uh, Bailey with a flurry, flurry of strikes, jumping knee. She heads up top. Nobody home. James with, uh, plants her face first, kip up. And she now heads to the top rope. CD sent on, covers Bailey reverse. Gets a two count. James with a kick to the midsection. Looking for her DDT, or Mickey DDT. Nope, catches Bailey with a forearm. Bailey ends up sending James out of the ring. Looks to fly, but Rush trips up Bailey. Crowd didn't like it. Balor sends Lashley out of the ring. Then launches Rush out of, out of, of the ring. Front flip takes both Rush and Lashley out. Back in the ring, Bailey to belly on James, and that'll do it. Pin Balor and Bailey by pin fall to advance to the same lines to face Jenna Mahal and Alicia Fox. I told you he was sets. Says, oh, at its ba uh, Bailey WWE, had the time of her life, and she owes it all to at Finn Balor. I just think. Next week, Miz and Oscar versus Naomi and, and Jimmy, and Carmella and R Truth versus Charlotte and Jeff Hardy. Dark match uh, 